So good to be here. Today we are going to have the official launch of the Portuguese FinTech Report 2021. Uh, we will start, we will have four chapters. We will start with Matilde and Antonio that will give a welcome and insights about the report. Then three panels. The first, banking and insurance and experience. Then Gonzalo Santuop from Visa will share an overview about the recent payment trends. Uh, followed by a panel moderated by Raquel about embedded finance and finally a discussion about open topics, central bank digital currencies, fintech enable ESG and European crowdfunding. Today we are at the Fintech House, a fintech hub that was designed two years ago to connect all the fintech ecosystem in one place. We now we have more than 60 startups in our community. Uh, and in this year, we open one new partner, INCM, focused on identity vertical. And we hosted the Ethereum Lisbon Hackathon last weekend. All these initiatives, the Portugal FinTech Report, the FinTech House, and the FinTech Solutions, are all created by Portugal FinTech, a non profit and non governmental association that started five years ago to connect the FinTech ecosystem and support the startups in four main building blocks. The first, talent, access to mature players supporting regulation and um, capital. Without waiting any longer, let's welcome Antonio and Matilde. Thank you, Mariana. Uh, it is a huge pleasure to present to you the fifth edition of the Portugal FinTech Report. Uh, it reflects how much effort we put into all the initiatives that we believe bring value to the ecosystem. The report is exact exactly that. Um, and we believe so because we gather primary information from uh, the truest and most direct source, uh, the fintechs uh, itself. Going briefly through uh, the main contents of the report, firstly, we present to you some statistics and findings um, gathered, uh, analyzing the data we collected. Um, then we bring you the top of fintech, uh, the 30 fintechs that we believe stood out during 2021. Also, the ones that were created this year, as well as um, international players uh, operating in Portugal. Um, this year we have a new chapter, uh, the trends uh, of this year from ESG to remote work, um, among many others. And we have um, key experts uh, sharing their views on the growth of these trends, as well as their impact on the sector. Um, then we have uh, a chapter on uh, collaboration uh, with uh, many partnerships where we see fintechs uh, enabling innovation by partnering with uh, mature players, uh, and we deepen three uh, specific uh, case studies. Uh, lastly, we have a chapter on open topics on regulation with the views of uh, our financial regulators. Today we'll have several panels on the articles, but let me briefly point out some of the statistics that we found on the reports. Um, looking at the top 30 fintechs, we see that the most populated uh, verticals are payments and money transfers, um, lending and credits, as well as insurtech. Um, and most of these companies were founded in 2019. Uh, together, these companies have uh, raised to date more than 400 million euros. And uh, in terms of headquarters, uh, about 80% of these companies are based out of Portugal. And the main hubs inside the country are Porto and Lisboa. From a broader uh, view of all the respondents of our open call, uh, we see uh, findings that uh, we can't find uh, anywhere else and regarding talent and looking specifically into uh, what is difficult to find in the job market for fintechs, we see that uh, it is most difficult to find uh, people with experience of about five years. Um, and in terms uh, of uh, uh, area, engineering is the most sought uh, position. These teams are composed on average of 30 employees. Um, and in terms of capital and access to investors, it is very interesting to see that about 80% of fintechs believe there has been an improvement in the access uh, to investors. Um, still, uh, about 46% uh, still say that it takes longer than six months uh, to fundraise. It is still a wide, um, uh, a wide span, time span. Um, when comparing uh, existing investors against investment demand, it is also very interesting to see that in earlier stages, such as pre-seed and seed, uh, current national investors are satisfying investment demand in above 
50%. Uh, but when we look at later stages, stages and specifically from Series D onwards, uh, we see that international investors are the ones satisfying investment demand uh, close to 100% and uh, national investors are close to zero. Looking into policy regulation and its, its impact on our fintechs, we see that regulatory fragmentation is the, the greatest hardship felt uh, in regulation and about 37% of fintechs believe that current regulation has been very much restrictive to their um, business development. Looking from a founder's barometer point of view, um, it is interesting to see that um, FinTech still believes that their greatest enabler are investors followed by associations, and, and these two cat categories um, sum up to 90% of the, the respondents. Um, and the greatest hardship felt uh, overall is still the sales cycle. Before passing on to Antonio, who will talk, talk a little bit about uh, how collaboration has evolved, let me leave you with a picture of, of our ecosystem, a very populated ecosystem. And, and I would dare each one of you uh, to obviously look into our report, but to take time uh, to read the profiles of these companies and to see how each one of them is bringing um, innovation and efficiency to our financial sector. Um, and I would also like to highlight that from these fintechs that we see here, approximately 85% approximately of them are B2B companies, which means they are aimed at uh, partnering, collaborating with, with existing players. And I'll let Antonio tell us more about that. Thank you for having us here. And um, I would like to point out that before, everyone, Mathilde shared us that the, the main hardship for these uh, startups is really uh, the sales cycle, and it's still a long sales cycle. And we are really trying to understand how can you also work on this. Because on the one hand, we still have a, an ecosystem of corporates that are still really reluctant to work with corporates, with startups. But on the other hand, we really see a shift on how they are thinking and they are perceiving partnerships with startups. And we always try to collect um, a lot of examples and, and case studies on how these mature players are partnering with startups to deliver new solutions to the market. And it's really growing. And I think through the pandemic, or maybe because of the pandemic, mature players understood that they need to work with these startups to deliver faster products and more innovative products to the market. And it's really... Um, I think shifting in the way we, we believe these partners in, uh, partnerships are uh, happening. Before it was kind of a, uh, com a competition, now it's a cooperation. And we, before, so we have a list of, we always try to uh, offer small cases, but we also have deep case studies in which we try to uh, show how mature players are partnering with startups to live in these solutions. And we have three case studies, I think you uh, all know them. But I think, for example, the case of Raise and Banco Vest, it's really interesting because it's a win-win situation that also is a win for the clients and for the projects. So uh, they are ch uh, channeling both sides for, the, for their businesses and they are kind of trying to uh, uh, bring two ecosystems together that offers for more traditional players access to new products and new solutions. On the other way around, we have like a lot of uh, uh, investment power coming to our projects, funding uh, projects that otherwise would not be funded by traditional channels. At least as fast as, as, as it's happening in Reds. And I think it's an interesting case on, on how you don't need to compete, but you can cooperate and you can do it like in a fast way. It doesn't need to take two years. It doesn't need to take a lot of, uh, um, uh, almost like killing each other after how we are going to solve this, but it can be a practical and, and, and simple approach. And I think the case study of Happy and Credible is really how you can speed up your, almost your main goal is that the time to yes and how can you help, how can a startup provide a huge player, an opportunity to be way faster automating how they collect information and how they provide an auto, uh, autonomous answer so that the, the client can have an immediate response to, this, to his credit. And I think the last case, for us it's really interesting because we kind of uh, try to not only connect mature players to startups, but also connect mature players between themselves. But I think this is the last dimension we are, I think Portugal, can, uh, Portugal FinTech can really work on. Is how can you also connect mature players to understand how can they also uh, share practices on how they are working with the startups. And in the FinTech 365, we collected six corporates, six national corporates, and they shared six, uh, five challenges and then were worked around in 10 POCs. And I think the idea here is really to highlight the importance of a proof of concept. And we tried to set up a, a project that was focused on the proof of concept as the main victory for a partnership between startups and, and corporates. And just to also give a, a, a quick uh, overview on this project. So one year ago, we set up this advisory arm called FinTech Solutions, 
which is a, a like a, a project in parallel to the fintech house where you are right now that basically is a, a consultancy company trying to help mature players working with these startups the idea is also to you already have the the gartner analysis that shows how players are at, uh, appearing we provide you the fintech ecosystem so that you can also compare these solutions against your more traditional suppliers the idea here is really to help mature players to speed up proof of concepts and to start really growing a capacity to innovate with the ecosystem because in the future financial services will really be built around an ecosystem instead of trying to be developing your own solutions always alone and i think from my side it's um this was all and thank you very much for the opportunity and i think i'll pass to mariana to present the, the panel thank you very much Thank you, Antonio. Thank you, Mathilde. We are now going to have the first panel about banking and insurance as an experience, moderated by Bruno Ribeiro. Uh, thank you, Bruno, and thank you, Miguel and Pedro, for being here and also participating in the panel. The floor is yours. This is really a, a topic we are now looking at a more holistic approach to uh, what experience means and uh, what the experience really is and uh, what kind of different experience uh, most companies can uh, can provide to their uh, to their customers <coughs> saying that what used to be uh, something that was uh, enclosed uh, in the in the marketing uh, department is now a uh, completely uh, a drive from uh, from all the the, the C level and uh, it's a worry that uh, that uh, runs across all the uh, all the orga uh, all the organization and uh, um, that is a, a major concern in every way uh, that we uh, connect and we relate with, uh, with customers. At Accenture, we've been talking, uh, we've been talking about uh, how this idea of experience uh, will evolve, will grow, uh, will grow further, and, uh, and we'll try to provide, uh, of course, better, uh, better results. And the idea, we came up with, a, with an idea and with an approach that is called the business of experience, which means uh, that instead of looking only at the, the, the touch point optimization and the idea of uh, uh, getting the best out of, uh, of every moment, uh, it's something that comes from inside the organization, something that is, uh, uh, is built around all, uh, all the departments and uh, that really tr uh, tries to, to, to transform and to and to provide a, a more consistent, holistic, and seamless experience uh, across uh, all the moments that the customer uh, contacts with uh, with the organization. Saying that, I think we have uh, two great uh, two great examples with us of uh, people who are trying to to change the way that uh, companies are relating with uh, with customers, uh, giving them. Uh, new opportunities and, uh, and new solutions. We have, uh, we have Miguel, which is uh, the, the co-founder and the CEO at uh, and Coverflux, and let me say one of the, the most known brands in the startup ecosystem for, uh, for a while. Mm -hmm. And Pedro, which is the, the, the co-founder and CEO at, um, at Youth. Uh, what is uh, what has Cover, uh, Coverflex been doing to to help their partners uh, provide uh, uh, added and uh, more meaningful and uh, in-depth experience with their clients? Thanks and good morning, everyone, and thanks for for inviting me here. Uh, in terms of like Coverflex is is in the realm of compensation. Compensation is a bit of a broad term that doesn't mean means a lot and at the same time doesn't mean much. Uh, so what we're actually trying to do is a B two B to see marketplace. Um, I could also maybe sit on the next panel because we actually consider ourselves as a, an embedded fintech marketplace. The idea is really to kind of hopefully create an operating system for, to help companies manage their compensation flows to their employees. Um, compensation is a broad term, so we're kind of talking about salary, so the base pay and the variable pay with commissions and bonuses. We're talking about benefits and perks, and then we're talking about equity. What we actually started with was creating this B2B marketplace that actually helps <coughs> companies who provide services within the benefits realm. So, and benefits could be anything from a lunch meal card solution 
uh, that we know from Sodexos, Edinburgh and others to fringe benefits, usually tax benefits. Uh, and therefore it could be childcare vouchers, it could be health and transportation. So things that actually have a tax advantage for the company and for the employee. Um, and we basically package all that together with hopefully a nice user interface for both the company to manage the multiple services. Um, so they have one platform where they can manage with a partnership with Visa, in this case where we give a Visa corporate debit card to every employee of, of our clients. We have, it's actually started only in January this year, so we started selling. We have around 410 uh, companies as clients, and we have around 9,200 employees that use CoverQuest today. Um, and we created that marketplace uh, in order for insurance companies, financial institutions that have PPR programs uh, and other retirement investment products that can address this market through CoverQuest. So we are, in fact, the distribution channel for this uh, usually incumbents uh, that have great products, uh, sometimes not great product experiences, and we that then therefore provide that experience. So we own the relationship, the user experience and the relationship with both the company and their employees. And therefore, then banking institutions, other financial institutions, and insurance companies providing, for example, in our case, health insurance and workers' compensation, we package all that together. And through an app, and, a, and in this case, a debit card, we get those products into the customer hands. So we are, in essence, like in, instead of maybe trying to fight the banks, in, instead of trying to fight with insurance companies, we've actually partnered up. It doesn't mean at one point we might actually go head to head. So it might be that insurance, in this case, we actually work as a digital broker. Um, so what we do is we actually, if, if there's a company, uh, PwC or Unbabble, or one of our existing clients that, for example, have their already an existing health insurance policy, they don't need to buy health insurance directly from us. They actually can migrate and transfer their health insurance policy to cover flex, and they still use the same Medish multi care or advanced care plan, but they will have then the user experience will be within CoverFlex. And that's how we think we can add value. At one point, we might partner up with Habit Analytics or other companies to actually then be able to provide better products, in this case, insure tech solutions. And that's really what we fight for. Can we create a better experience? And our really motto is can we address the, as much as possible the biggest share of wallets? of compensation. So all that money that goes from companies to people, and we're in a very different world from maybe two years ago, from 20 years ago, the, the future of work is kind of the present of work, and like that has changed a lot. Uh, the concept of payslip, the concept of payslip hasn't evolved for the last four decades, right? And it doesn't, it hasn't really evolved. And if I think about Salesforce trying to own the sales budget of companies, if I think about HubSpot trying to own the marketing budget of companies, we're trying to really own that compensation money flows. Um, and that means it's actually the biggest cost if I look into the OPEX operating expenses of companies across Europe, US, Latin, Asia. Over, usually over 60% of those OPEX are related to people expenses, labor costs. And we just wanna make sure that companies can basically get better compensation packages, more flexible people nowadays they think about Revolut, they think about Glovo having everything immediate and to their own needs. And CoverFlex hopefully will change the paradigm of compensation to a very fixed, top-down approach into a bit more flexible that I'm very different from you and from you, and maybe I have, the way I'm thinking about compensation might be, I just had a baby, a baby girl, and I'm thinking about how to support that, and I'm thinking more about health and, and, and uh, kind of, health insurance, I'm thinking about uh, pharmacy and other things, and you might be just wanting to invest a lot more in crypto. And, and the packages, like we think about salaries and compensation packages, they're very rigid. So what we're thinking about user experience is how can we make it a bit more flexible so companies can be more attractive to their employees. Okay. First of all, congratulations on the, on the little girl. Hope everything, <laughs> is going, hope everything is going well. It's quite a, quite a challenge. We'll see that too. <laughs> As most tech stuff is uh, as raising a startup. But uh, uh, I, think you, I think you'll get there. Um, and taking on the, the, the last thing that, uh, that you said, that you're, you're working on, uh, on trying to improve the experience. And that, uh, There's a lot of ways to, to 
try to we try to do that. Uh, we got into a, a specific one and uh, let's say a not very obvious one from somebody that is uh, is looking on the on the outside. Uh, Pedro is going, uh, I think, on a different uh, on a different perspective. Uh, I think the, 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 the or I remember the first time I entered the, your website and trying to know what uh, unique was. Uh, I got that feeling. Oh, okay, I'm minority minority report, uh, report is coming is coming to life. Um, but uh, somehow you are trying to to create a, a more standardized experience to the to the customer and uh, creating a more direct uh, direct relation that eliminates some of the of the process uh, in between uh, and that gives a more uh, uh, of course a more efficient uh, more safe way and uh, there, are, there are lots of, uh, of advantages that uh, uh, you can easily explain and you can easily understand aren't you afraid of creating uh, some sort of uh, so standardized experience that will uh, limit the, the capacity of, uh, of companies to, uh, to differenti uh, differentiate one from, uh, from each other? Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, uh, also, congratulations. Uh, let me backtrack a bit on your question just to explain what we do so then I can answer the question. So anyone, anywhere, with any device uh, should be able to authenticate with any account without PAN. So no need to use cards, no need to use um, any tokens, any passwords, no need to uh, actually take your phone out and do something with it. So you should be able to exchange your credentials seamlessly uh, in a very convenient, secure, and private way. And privacy is our most important pillar because if we are authenticating, if we are authenticating someone, and uh, secure about how their uh, biometrics is being used. Um, so two things from what you said in the beginning and, and now. Customer experience for us is, is, so you mentioned customer experience was more marketing and now it's widespread to organizations. I agree and I feel that customer experience is actually the marketing. So marketing now is not about outbounding and trying to convince people to come to you. It's about how you provide your experience. So that's why CoverFlex works. Uh, I have CoverFlex at Unique as well. Um, <laughs> and we are only uh, a couple of people. We were three and now we're uh, a few more. But the thing is, you need a good experience, and I don't need to receive a lot of marketing uh, information to choose CoverFlex. I do that because the experience is good. So what we want to provide is this ability for really non-friction, completely seamless way of authenticating. And that's what happens with FinTech as well. Uh, I mean, you want your clients to uh, go to you and subscribe to your services or onboard without friction. So registration and authentication are the two main parts to, to that process. When you have very great experience from the user point of view, where you know you just have to look at something and it's done, that's what you want. So touching then on the second point on the on the personalization, I don't see us doing this as something standardizing. It's actually the opposite because once you you're logging in or, or or authenticating so so in a, such an easy way, it becomes automatically personalized because authentication is actually the basis to personalize. Once I have some more things I can propose to you, which are different uh, for, for, for Miguel and for you, then I can act on it as a, as a business and do something different for each of you. So actually, the authentication part is where you can now become more personal. Um, I think the other point you're, you're, you're mentioning there with personalization is, if you automate too much, then you kind of lose the personal, the human touch in the experience. Yeah. Um, but the human touch is not to be, uh, so, we don't want to go to a bank and spend uh, two hours talking to a person because we need to feel informed. We may want to talk to that person and know more about their services. It's not about the admin or the bureaucratic stuff that you want the human touch for. You want to automate everything and then part with the personal touch, you can have time for that if you want to do that as a customer. So I, I don't know if I went yeah. to the point. I think it might be pretty clear that uh, there's way more than, uh, than standardization. Uh, I think we have a few minutes left, or uh, at least we'll try to, uh, to rush it the the, the next uh, the next topic. But uh, I think it's really really important that uh, and of great value, and uh, it wouldn't make much sense to to have these two two guys here and uh, not asking them about uh, what you think about the the future and uh, uh, if you if you could uh, if you could imagine uh, or predict the the next uh, trends in uh, in experience uh, regarding uh, fintechs, uh, which one would you would you bet on? And you probably will. Like. 
Um, so I, th I think I think one of the one of the main uh, issues is um, when you when your user experience is completely messed up in the world. So people are, are, find it normal that you go to a website, you want to do something, and then they ask you, look at these six pictures and tell me where the bicycles are. And this is you, you just accept that. So if they told you you have to run around the table twice, and then you can log in, if you had to do that, you would do that. That doesn't make any sense. So why would you be able? Why would you be selecting uh, semaphores or traffic lights and and, and bicycles in, in websites? And that's what's kind of messed up now. So that's that's again user experience. You need to think about as a user, not as a as a bank. What do I want to my customer? So as a user, I want to go there and, and log in or, or enter. So you see that in a few use cases. For example, um, buying stuff. If you go to the supermarket, uh, you know the payments physically paying for stuff at the moment is very uh, obsolete, so it's kind of going on the table, but in a way that we think it's normal, uh, which is uh, actually, you have to put a card, you have to put a pin, this doesn't make any sense, it's completely uh, a loss of time, a waste of time. Um, so I would say paying physically and online is messed up, so you have 3D Secure, for example. So you go to some website, it's you, I know it's me, I have money, I want to pay, but they then say, okay, now you have to do semaphores or traffic lights or bicycles. It's something different, but it's still, you have to go to this website, you may receive a code on your phone. It's so complicated that the experience is bad. So I would say, you know, paying uh, in a physical environment or online was one of the big things. Um, and then I, I think the other issue is onboarding for clients at the moment. So in the FinTech area, if you want to start an account, uh, things are changing now, we see in, in many of different ways of onboarding people with Revolut and, and others in Portugal as well. But, you know, filling forms or, or scanning cards and sending or going physically to places doesn't make any sense. So I think that's a huge space now for, for the next couple of years. Miguel. I think the, the question is, um, I think there's, there's so many really interesting areas. And I think the FinTech, the insure tech revolution, I think if I look back I'm actually pretty bullish about the, the insure tech one uh, and the B2B fintech one. So I think a lot of the revolution that, we, and that was brought into the market was like the B2C kind of revolution. And that happened both specifically fintech first, then insure techs, and like great examples like BFOX in, Ger in, in Germany now, like the, I think it's still the biggest insure tech company now in private insure tech company in Europe. Um, and I think the next kind of wave uh, is on the B2B aspect but it's also trying to figure out, I think the, the interesting thing and the difference about the consumer side and the, and, and the B2B specifically FinTech and InsureTech is extremely regulated, right? And there is not like, where in consumer, you can really have the kind of, the new startup to really trying to kind of be super bold, like transferize, let's kill the banks, Revolut, <laughs> let's kind of change the banks, even though they're kind of, they had like all these other banks behind them, including Lloyd's. I think on the B2B aspect, I think it has to be a lot more collaborative. Even if you create a really great consumer experience on the insure tech side, most of the times, and pretty, I think it's 99% of the times, you'll have a reinsurance company behind you, right? So the, the collaboration between incumbents and the new companies will be significantly different from what happened on kind of the, the consumer revolution. And I think that will be extremely interesting, but extremely challenging because they have completely different mentalities. Uh, ways of working will be very different. Leg tech legacy uh, will be a major, major challenge going forward. And I think then geographically, because it's so regulated, then I think countries will have like an opportunity to create like differentiation, right? And sandbox programs are a, good, a great example. Like I'm thinking uh, student finance, for example, in the UK, um, and, and the opportunity of not being able to do it the same way in Portugal. And like, I think those, all those different rhythms will create different dynamics. And I think that's super interesting. And like another massive space, nothing compared to this, is like, and we've seen that changing in two years, is the crypto space and the, the whole blockchain space. And that I think is still four years from kind of actually maturing. Um, but given the, the hype that we have, that there's a lot of money going in, a lot of institutional money, uh, institutional money going in. Actually, I think Anchorage is just announcing a new round at a two billion uh, valuation. And I think it's just like another great example of how use, user experience on crypto has been kind of terrible and very geeky uh, until very recently. 
um, and if and you'll see dramatic changes in future. So I think there's a bunch of areas, super interesting, um, really really challenging, and I think there'll be a lot of culture because of ge geos uh, and like the incumbents with the new companies. Uh, but it is it is the space to crack. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have a good perspective that uh, in the few uh, in the next couple of years we'll have uh, innovative ideas, innovative companies, and uh, I think Miguel and uh, and Pedro are uh, clearly a, a good example and probably uh, faces that we'll see a, a lot more uh, presenting the the evolution of the of the sector and not only on uh, on fintech but. Uh, on the way that uh, companies relate with uh, with their customers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to, to you all. It was a pleasure. Let's now welcome Gonzalo Sanchez from Visa, country manager of Visa, that will share um, a, an overview about recent payments in France. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, First of all, thanks to Portugal Fintech for the invitation. Uh, it's great to be here. Actually, I was just thinking that uh, you know it's great to see two examples of fintechs that are actually disrupting the payments market and improving the user end experience. And they are Portuguese, and they are having an impact on our day to day. So, you know, uh, I think about what we can say about um, Visa. Of course, you know the company, and you'll see some brand campaign which we, is live now trying to change a bit the perception of what Visa is. Uh, we are not a credit card company. Uh, actually, we are a company that connects people and businesses. And we are also here uh, to help Portuguese fintechs to grow. And looking at the ecosystem and these two great examples that we just had, um, you know, I think clearly for Visa, this is a, an ecosystem that makes a lot of sense. And we really want to be here to partner, collaborate and partner. Uh, I think for today, what I wanted to share with you is some payment trends which we have been seeing uh, across uh, the markets in Europe, mostly. Um, and of course, we have been living uh, a pandemic situation for the last 19 months, and this has accelerated these payment trends. Um, basically, we have seen that uh, fintechs have had a tremendous contribution to the payments disruption, also to improve the digital user end experience, and we're going to see some examples of that. So I think the five trends, I'm not going to show one by one, you see the five, but uh, you know, they are not new, but I think I would like to say a few things about each one of those. Uh, first of all, of course, online and mobile commerce growth. I think for the first time in our lives, we were all stuck at home without having the chance to go and buy things outside. Even going to a supermarket was a challenge for most of us. So actually, this has brought people to use you know, e-commerce, mobile commerce, uh, and in case of Portugal, I think, and other markets in Europe, we have seen that there was a leap forward, I think, of three to five years, no one knows, in e-commerce and mobile commerce. Uh, the other thing which I think is important to say is that we have seen a tremendous growth across Europe's, in Europe. In more than 20 countries, we have seen 40% year-on-year growth in number of e-commerce transactions. Uh, I think it's clear that you end users are more comfortable with e-commerce and that companies are investing a lot more on enabling e-commerce for some of them, others to improve the experience. At the end of the day, I think one thing, it was already said uh, this morning, but consumers expect to have a seamless, unique experience and secure, of course, experience, you know, independently of the device they are using or the channel they are using. And this is a very important problem which we need to fix still in the in the e-commerce space. Uh, then new ways to pay. I think you know we have seen account to account gaining momentum. Also, open banking uh, gaining momentum in Europe. The number of or the volume of transactions that is going through these new ways to pay is still low. We have to say, but what we have been seeing is an increasing number of banks and companies sharing the data uh, in terms of open banking. I think it's a topic that we could spend all morning uh, talking about it. It's not the objective of today, uh, you know. But clearly, I think is something that is still uh, fresh. It's only three years of open banking and it's still uh, a lot to happen. Uh, and then, of course, it, it, we all just mentioned it, crypto. I think, you know, crypto is something that has been around for 13 years, uh, since 2008. Uh, we all know it was Bitcoin, 
But now we have more than 10,000 crypto assets or cryptocurrencies. People also call it cryptocurrency. And you know the market cap is estimated to be 1.5 trillion dollars. Okay, so it's it's a huge market. In terms of the payments, actually what we have been seeing is what you call the crypto backed programs. So most of these companies that sell crypto also have a card, normally a debit card, associated with the account where you can spend and uh, the amounts which you have, let's say, won in the in the crypto market with your card and having great rewards, something like 5%, 8% cashback, which is something the banks can compete with. So Visa has, is backing 35 of these programs, and uh, it's a clearly a trend which we have seen in, in payments and, and crypto. Moving on to buy now, pay later. Well, everyone talks about buy now, pay later. I was just talking with my good friend Gonzalo. Uh, when we started working in 1998, we used to do buy now, pay later. It was, at the time, save me the change It was the name we used to. But, you know, instead of 10 seconds to give credit to someone, uh, it was like more 30 minutes or one hour. People sending their documents by fax and blah, blah, blah. So by now, pay later is nothing new. I think what is new is really the experience. And this is, I think, the threat that, uh, you know, the established players need to realize is that they have been in this market for 40 years. And if they don't change, others will disrupt them, clearly. So it's a great opportunity. Still, the volumes also low. It's less than 2% of overall e-commerce in buy now, pay later firms. Uh, from, for the addressable market for buy now, pay later, I would say the market share should be more or less at 8% at this stage, and potentially will get to 14% in 2024. So definitely some big growth ahead. I think it's one of those topics that no one knows how it will end. But for sure, I think we have explained it. It's quite easy to understand. It's nothing new. It's just a question of digital experience. Um, and finally, the digital wallets. I think, you know, when I started uh, working in, 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 in payments, uh, I remember that paying with the mobile was something really which we were thinking ahead, for the future ahead. And this was back in 2000. And, and now it's a reality, right? Uh, globally and domestically in multiple European markets. So the COVID also, also helped to accelerate this. I think the consumers are now um, using it much more. And actually, we see that global wallets like Apple Pay, Google Pay are present in more than 35 markets, uh, including Portugal, of course. So uh, you know, I think consumers will adopt it. And clearly, uh, what people want is what you call the one-stop shop, where I can do multiple things just beyond purchasing physically with the phone. I also want to buy online, and I also want to do money movement and other things which I need to do on my, or what you need to do on the daily basis. So that's it about the trends. Uh, you know, I'm not going to talk much about Visa, but clearly we are here to help. Okay, we, if you have something related to payments or something that you believe we can help, please contact us. We want to make an impact uh, in the Portuguese market, and we want to help Fintechs to succeed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gonçalo. Uh, now let's welcome a panel about embedded finance with Marta Palmeiro uh, from Student Finance, Domingos Bruce from Abit Analytics, moderated by Raquel Nogueira from Fintech Solutions. Good morning, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to have you here. So embedded finance and banking as a service is unlocking new ways to serve banking services and features. And for that reason, could you explain a little bit more uh, what you do at your startups, please? Uh, sure, shall I start? Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. So uh, student finance, and I think this is just a, little, a little bit what I was saying, so we, are, we call ourselves a study now pay later platform where we are allowing users uh, to defer the payments on ex education. Uh, how we work is a B2B2C, a B2B2C models. We're partnered with the education programs, um, skill-centric, so the majority of them are actually technology boot camps, uh, teaching the high demand and high growth skills in the labor market, and this is web development, cybersecurity, data science, blockchain, etc. 
Uh, and so we allow users to access the education programs without paying anything up front, and then we structure payments as a percentage of their income once they are employed and earning above uh, a minimum income threshold. So at the end of the day, it is uh, the per payment method, but also uh, success-based in the sense that we are very invested, we and our partner schools, uh, in the professional outcomes of, of the students. Great, thank you. Hi, thank you for, for having us. Um, so at Habit, what we do is uh, we are a digital broker. Uh, and what we do is we enable companies that have large pre-existing communities, customers, users, uh, to distribute uh, insurance in a seamless way. So we bridge the space between the reinsurance uh, and the insurance space and the distribution space. Uh, this is what we do. Pretty simple. Thank you. So very two very different, but still very uh, similar in a way that so many different spaces, so this is explained. So, Domingos, who do you think is pushing further embedded insurance solutions? Traditional insurers that want to distribute their products closer to the selling point, or merchants and non-financial players who want to differentiate and add revenue streams? Um, it's a good question. I would say both, um, but for different reasons. Uh, being them, uh, on the merchant side, on the distribution side, uh, they have all the incentives to not only have additional revenue streams, like you, you said, but also to bring additional products in the context of their core activity. So, and this is the, the, the main reason for the distribution side. Uh, and because they have the, the placement power, um, insurance players want to be there and they want to be the, the suppliers. So different reasons, but here is where we actually see different incumbents driving them in the distribution space. Uh, this is what we do, pretty simple. Thank you. So very two, very different, but still very uh, similar in a way that so many different spaces, so this is explained. So Domingos, who do you think is pushing further embedded insurance solutions? traditional insurers that want to distribute their products closer to the selling point, or merchants and non-financial players who want to differentiate and add revenue streams? Um, it's a good question. I would say both, um, but for different reasons. Uh, being them uh, on the merchant side, on the distribution side, uh, they have all the incentives to not only have additional revenue streams, like you, you said, but also to bring additional products in the context of their core activity. So, and this is the, the, the main reason for the distribution side. Uh, and because they have the, the placement power, um, insurance players want to be there and they want to be the, the suppliers. So different reasons, but here is where we actually see different incumbents driving themselves, between themselves, each other. So uh, it's pretty, pretty interesting to watch this. Yeah, absolutely. And now, Marta, student finance is embedding financial solutions in the journey to enrolling training for programs. Why do you think traditional credit players were not able to tap into this market? And how do you differentiate? So a, a big part of the differentiation is really on one part being embedded in the, the, the user application process within the schools. Uh, so we are completely connected and, and integrated in that process. But also the fact that we focus so much on, on, on outcomes. So we don't separate ourselves or the financing from actually the, the act of attending the program and what people want out of the program, which is to secure a job. And so it's how we design the product which is quite different uh, from uh, you know, traditional uh, financing product uh, to align with the user success and, and the outcome. So at the end of the day, what we do is we are absorbing uh, a big part of the user risk, right? So if people never get a job, they will never have the obligation to actually repay. But we do this because we have a deep understanding on the labor market. And so at the moment now it's student finance, so we are built on top of a strong labor market infrastructure where we are analyzing uh, on a weekly basis over 1 million unique job posts up to the skill level. So we, when we are underwriting, we know that there is demand uh, for you know, these skills in the labor market. And that is a big part of then one understanding that employability and then how can we optimize the access from our users to the job market. So we do a lot of also matchmaking and user recommendations. Uh, so at the end of the day, we are a lot more connected to the user throughout the journey. And I would not even say that we are a lender. I think we are a partner of the user throughout the journey. And do you see potential in offering these solutions to traditional education players, such as universities, both have bachelor and master's degree? 
Yeah, so, so the model should work uh, across uh, education segments. What is important uh, is that actually there is a good balance and ROI between the cost of the education and the outcomes that it generates, right? So when we are structuring, obviously, the terms of, of, of the financing, that is what we care about, that actually people will be able to repay based on their future income. Uh, so that income, future income projections is actually a core part of that. The reality is that balance does not exist in a lot of you know, the undergrad or, you know, yeah. uh, MBA programs, just because the prices have been pushed uh, by external and schools setting the price without actually focusing on outcomes. And so we actually think we have a very important role in the market into creating that balance. And, you know, as long as there is a, a very healthy relationship between cost of the education and future income, uh, the model will absolutely apply. And so we actually have a partnership with IE Business School, but now for one of their data science boot camps. But so the intention there is absolutely to roll, out, roll that out to more programs. Cool, so we'll be expecting yeah. that from you. <laughs> and Ming, in embedded finance, how do you balance the simplicity of the journey, simplifying the options for the client, <coughs> and the marketplace approach, allowing for suppliers comparison? Um, well, I think you, you don't. <laughs> you actually don't. Um, it's a, a two ways uh, path. So. And if you simplify the marketplace approach, at the end of the day, you are having the different approach, which is not the marketplace approach. So our, our answer to that is actually use data. And you use data combined with embedded distribution. So when you have a partner that has uh, distribution, and like I was saying before, placement power, but also has the data that allows you uh, to create the context for that customer, then you know exactly what that customer needs. Uh, and of course, you can show them 10 different products, but you can also show them the exact product that that customer wants. Uh, and at the end, if the customer wants to see more, then you show the, the, the catalog of, of products. But uh, I would say that the data is actually driving the, the experience there. Thank you. We know that the ERIT system has just launched its own project to um, study uh, you know, the, viabil the feasibility of, of the G digital ERO. Um, what are the main concerns and risks of CBDCs from the ECB's perspective, uh, starting uh, with this new project that has been launched? So, uh, like, like, like I said, you know, like the number said, 86% uh, of, uh, of the central banks are looking at this. In Europe, we are also looking at this. We have launched uh, this Euro Digital or Digital Euro project. Um, the, the, the the risks and, and the challenges here is the way this CBDC can be designed and what will be the <coughs> the impacts. Sorry for sorry for that. The the, the real challenge is the design of the, the CBDC may impact in several um, points in, in, in the way the, 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 the economy uh, works. And that has to be taken in consideration while, while develop, developing this, 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 new, this new payment solution, this, this new form of central bank money. Um, one, one of the focus, and I think it's the focus for everyone, when, when we develop a product that is, we, we are trying to, to address some user needs. So the CBDC will have to be designed in a way to address the user needs and, and the usability of the user. But also will be, uh, will have to be designed in a way to prevent some risks to, from materializing. And these risks are risks at, at the level of the payment systems. So the CBDC needs to be usable by uh, and, 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 and accessible by most of the users that we want to that would like to use that payment instrument, they will have to, to, to have uh, authentication, KYC rules, so a lot of, uh, uh, of risks that need to be addressed and considered while, while designing this, this CBDC. Um, the risks for the banking sectors, because CBDC is central bank money, it's a little bit different from the, the, the deposits that we have at banks today, so it may, may be a, a, t a, t a trend to Cried, cried out the deposits in the banks and move all the money for central bank uh, deposits. And this w w would create some problems in, in, in the banking system, in, in the granting of credit they do to, to, to finance the economy. Financial stability may increase, uh, reduce 
associated with, with the, the banking stability, reduce the access to credit and, and the, the credit given to the economy, and that creates uh, problems in developing, in launching new, new, new pro projects. Um, monetary pol policy, once again, also how would this impact monetary policy? And of course, one, one, one last risk uh, related to cyber security. So we are talking about digital solutions, online solutions, and um, this has to be, um, you, all, all of you more, more than I probably know the, the risks and, and, and the, 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 the what we need to do to ensure that uh, payments are, are, are secure. Just to conclude on Euro Digital, so we are now on an investigation phase. This, this, during this phase, the, the Euro system will study the design and the characteristics and all these risks, how to address these risks for a period of two years, so until close to the end of 2023, this investigation phase will, will run. Um, and um, so we are, we are now on that, that point. Well, I think that interesting for, for this audience may be that uh, last Monday, the ECB has launched, launched an invitation for, uh, they call it, tech experts to join the CBDC debate. So I would say that for all the fintechs across uh, Europe and uh, definitely in Portugal, we have a lot, uh, as we can see here today, are invited to propose themselves to cooperate in this debate that the ECB is launching and uh, on four specific topics. And let me get to my, uh, my, my, my specific data not to <laughs> give them the wrong information. So what they are trying to look at this point and, and uh, have, have invited uh, ex tech experts to join this discussion is uh, privacy uh, preserving uh, technology. So entity, uh, fintechs that are discussing and working on this may be interested in, in uh, di this debate with, with, with the euro system and with ECB. Offline payments, so how to avoid double spending uh, because CBDC uh, will have probably to be usable uh, on offline, so how can you guarantee that uh, there are no double spending on, on, this, on, this, on these funds? The top up, the funding and the defunding of the digital wallets, and uh, the limitation or disincentivizing of hoarding of, of, of funds. So CBDC is to be used for payments, not for uh, storing uh, large amounts of, of value. So here is the, let's, the challenge for the Portuguese fintech market. Uh, so if, uh, if you are interested in this, maybe a, a, good, a good point to interact with, with the project and to show to Europe what uh, Portuguese fintechs can, can contribute on this. Thank you, uh, thanks very much. Uh, and let's hope that uh, fintechs do, do respond to, to that calling. Um, we heard uh, a little bit from the uh, regulators' side. Uh, uh, one of the reasons why CBDCs have become such a, a strong uh, hot topic is the fact that uh, they are seen as a, a bit of a response, the, the institutional response to the rise in cryptocurrencies and private um, payment solutions. Uh, and I think that it would be interesting to hear from uh, from you, Pedro, um, and uh, who is working um, in uh, Utrust, which is basically a blockchain payment platform solution for Correct. cryptocurrencies. Um, and looking at the crypto market, how do you how do you see CBCs impacting the crypto market or and, and the overall mar marketing? So, uh, what's your reading uh, in terms of, of this this movement from central banks, and how do you see that that the crypto market will uh, reply to that? Okay, thank you. Uh, let me start by saying something. Usually when I speak in panels like this, I usually know where I should enter, you know? <laughs> no, meaning that the topic is, is easy to understand. Well, I should come from this angle or this angle. And this I was all over the place because <laughs> I have so many places I could start from. But, and I have nothing against banks. But for me, this shows that banks, because they have such a privileged position for so many years, they, they tend to take a lot of time to understand what's going on. And then, even by saying we are studying, we are studying, it's starting to move. I know I live in an eco chamber, obviously, but things are not are not starting to move. They are moving in the trillions of dollars daily. <laughs> and CBDCs are we already have stable coins. I don't know. Sometimes uh, I struggle a little bit because I might get too 
geeky and boring. <laughs> or sometimes I might be too high level because I have no perception of beta values in the, that echo chamber. But so stable coins are, are a response of the market because of the, the volatility. Like so they are being used, I don't know, we have 300 million crypto holders right now in the world. Well, uh, statistically calculation, obviously. But maybe one third of those touches stable coins. And on a daily basis, anyone that trades uses stable coins. Uh, I know a lot of people in, in the blockchain ecosystem that don't even touch fiat. It's everything goes through stable coins and direct into the market. So I would say that if banks uh, change the way they have been working for hundreds of years and start being transparent, meaning that if CBDCs are deployed in transparent blockchains, and if they are, let's say, uh, built on top of Ethereum ERC20 tokens, it's it's the death of stable coins, meaning that for us gateway payments, it's amazing because it's, it's much simpler. There is no third party. So people can just go from crypto to uh, stable coin CBDCs and not fiat. I know it's a bit, it's a bit the same, but it's not the same if it's constructed in the blockchain and if the blockchain is open and if the blockchain is then, let's say, in Ethereum instantly, any gateway payments in the world could accept CBDC and just kill um, stable coins. So I would say that if, so answering directly, <laughs> if banks become transparent and choose to work with what exists and not as islands, it's amazing. If they go the black box way, as we have been seeing for hundreds of years, I would say that there might even be more antibodies because people that are already in the ecosystem might feel that it's just a, a bank-like response and not a let's join them of the movement. So essentially they, they either uh, are a bit absorbed in terms of culture and uh, how it works or they go their separate ways and with different demands and, and exactly. places to... I would say it's not obvious, it's obviously an example, but let's say in, in Portugal in particular, it would be the same as we've seen with Uber and taxis. The first reaction was protests, try to forbid, but they failed to understand that people preferred Uber for some reason. So, and now they joined it. So it's, it's everyone is living peacefully. Taxis do the same as Ubers. A lot of taxis are Ubers. So it's the same. It's not going against, it's the understanding. It's if the user touched it, and it's better. It's the work of the banks to understand that and go and, and not. It, it's like I know Accenture and the MIT are studying the, the, the United States government. It's like a two years or three years plan. As we say, and now I am the, the crypto people now have the NFT ecosystem as well. As, and we say it's like one month is one year. So I don't know, three years studying CBDCs for me, we don't know what's going to happen in three years in the crypto space. It's like, uh, light years away, so I'm a bit uh, afraid for the banks that if they take so much time, there's even a new thing, a faster thing. The bo the, the concept of no borders is already live. The, the the concept of instant is already live. So it's like it's two parallel worlds. Yes, I think that well, the the you know the the institutional banks and and central banks uh, are just trying to uh, weigh on in all the risks and and trying to do. Uh, you know, uh, not putting the oxes ahead of the <laughs> carriage to translate from a Portuguese saying, but um, it's it's not easy, uh, and uh, or oh, the dynamic between uh, between the, the ecosystem uh, crypto and the more traditional uh, the financial system. Um, and on on that note, I think that we should now move on to the, our next topic, which is fintechs enabling ESG. Um, and we have Nicholas uh, Phillips to talk uh, to us a little bit about it. Um, and uh, Nicholas is, is founder of Reflore Initiative, which is basically an enterprise that helps business become a bit more sustainable. Um, so uh, Nicholas, what can you talk to us about uh, the ways in which fintechs you know, are enabling ESGs and what trends do you see in the market um, in this respect? First, thank you, Mariana. Thank you, Portugal Contact, and my fellow panel members. Uh, when I think about ESG in general, I think about uh, a reflection on the, on the, let's say, Newton's statement of what is the purpose of a company. Right? What is the purpose of a firm? 
I think that after a couple of cycles, 2008 and now 2020, we are going to reflect and, and last year we, we had 200 CEOs in the US saying something like that or signing a letter saying that, okay, maybe the purpose of a firm is not just to maximize value for the shareholder, but actually to maximize value to the stakeholders because it has a sort of responsibility towards society. Companies do have this sort of, of uh, responsibility. This responsibility can be seen in the eyes of the environment, of social, and of course of governance. Right? Uh, I see that companies are moving in this direction, but I think that companies are moving in this direction in a sense of, uh, uh, because of what uh, the last panelist, uh, I'm sorry, the last moderator said. Companies are realizing that they need to be customer centric. And what does the customer actually want? What, what do people want? I think that, let's see, 99% of people agree that we have a climate crisis. Uh, people agree that there are things that should, that are done in one way that should not be done in that way, and therefore they need to be changed, right? Companies which are understanding their customer and putting their customer in the center are understanding that and changing towards their customers. That's how I see ESG in general. When I see uh, uh, Marta and uh, student finance that just mentioned, I see a perfect example of this. It's uh, uniting or aligning the incentives. She gains when her customer gains, right? Uh, I think this is, this is the point for, for ESG in a general point, right? If everyone believes that there is a climate crisis, and let's be sure of this, there is a climate crisis. If we look at the IPCC report and all of that, there's only one way in which we can solve that. It's through sustainable finance. And I think that's why, that's why initiatives like this is super important and fintech space is super important. Fintechs, I think, have uh, historically entered in the gaps where the incumbents could not serve properly their clients. A bit of what you were mentioning in a bit, right? Uh, this is where the fintech space enters. <coughs> Having that said, and thinking about what uh, customers want towards ESG, which I was just mentioning, I think there's a great space for, uh, for fintechs to join. I think that the biggest challenges that we have on ESG today is data collection. It's difficult, it's not similar to everybody. The, after collecting the data, comparing this data and having a set, actually, if we look at the three biggest standards for ESG scoring in the world today, their correlation is 0 0.3, which means they're not correlated at all. So there's a lot of work to be done in this. And I think that the best approach that fintechs and new companies and newcomers can have to this is looking into the challenges that we have, for example, the standards and the dressing with technology, how to solve them, serving on B2B. I think that uh, someone said before, I'm not sure who, that uh, in the beginning, fintechs were competing in the kill the bank system. I think that we've moved past that. I think that we are much more in a let's cooperate, let's uh, unite, integrate to better serve the customer because it's in everyone's interest to do that. I don't know if I responded to your yeah, question, I but... Uh, <laughs> certainly in the environment, <laughs> um, So thank you very much for, for, for your uh, intervention. And I think that now we can move to the uh, last topic, last open topic of, of today's panel, which is the European Cloud Funding Regime. And we have Gisele from Race with us. Uh, Race, who succeeded uh, uh, IPO very successfully on 2018. Um, and uh, it's a leading uh, crowdfunding platform. Um, and we are about to, the, the new um, crowdfunding uh, regime is about to enter into force. Um, so, um, Jose, uh, what do you think? Uh, well, do you think that uh, this new regime will disrupt the crowdfunding uh, market? Uh, and what are you seeing as the main advantages of, of having, uh, uh, well, uh, a uniform uh, set of rules throughout the, the throughout Europe. I, 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 well, 
Good, good morning. I think a lot of topics have been here discussed, and um, uh, this one is very different from the um, crypto topics uh, that were addressed here at the beginning of this of this uh, panel. But with regards to the European to the European crowdfunding regulation, I think it's going to deliver um, some new set of rules across all member states that will enable some models to operate uh, where they are now not able to operate. So Portugal, due to its uh, very stiff, let's call it stiff legal uh, legal um, uh, uh, framework, we're not able to actually have a functioning um, equity crowdfunding platforms. You know, it doesn't work on a scalable level. On the on the lending side, there are also going to be benefits coming from coming from the new regulation that are going to enable um, lending platforms to scale uh, at a greater level. Now, what this what this crowdfunding regulation does, I like. Th I think it was it was definitely drafted pre crypto. Uh, so the way I'm starting to see the world in terms of regulation is uh, pre crypto acceptance and post crypto acceptance, right? And I, this was definitely drafted pre crypto acceptance uh, because I think the world is going to really change now going forward, uh, in the sense that uh, there was sort of a, a, a huge vi view that there was going to be a massive crackdown on crypto. We're going to finish crypto. It's not going to be, it's going to be nothing. Uh, everyone was at some point convinced that, you know, it's not regulated, it's a scam, let's bring it down. That didn't happen. Now there's trillions of dollars circulating through the system. You bring it down, you create a, <laughs> you create a financial meltdown, and, or, or not, question mark. And, uh, and so you see people are actually struggling to find ways of, you know, competing, adding new features to the current system. There are lots of issues with crypto. Uh, there, are loads of, there are a lot of benefits, uh, but that was you know super covered uh, before. But back to the crowdfunding. It was drafted pre-crypto. So what does that mean? It means that the rules that were applied to this in terms of the consumer, in terms of sort of some of the regulations, they were, you know, they were done in a world where people, you know, where people are still concerned that the consumers are not at the moment risk takers. That the consumers are not, uh, that the investors are not uh, nowadays able to access information and to make a fair judgment. I think that world is also a different world. It's a different world. 20 years ago, it was fair to say that the consumer didn't have access to information maybe, could be misled by, by scammers, etc. Nowadays, I mean, everybody has definitely checked the box of I accept the risks of investing in something that's different, that's not regulated, or that's you know more lightly regulated, and I accept the risks. And I think the crowdfunding regulation was drafted pre this, and so it's going to suffer. And the, a very clear example is, we're going to make people that want to invest 1,000 euros in crowdfunding, equity, loan, whatever, we're going to make them do all these kinds of assessment tests. You know, is your risk appetite correct? You know, are you happy? Are you aware that you can lose your 500 euros? I mean, this is totally not the right. This, this is like, I mean, it's pre-crypto. Is anyone asking anyone that's buying Bitcoin or anything on, are you, yeah, they, there's a checkbox. Yeah, we want the risk, let's go. Just people, and I think this mindset is, we need to embrace it and we see that everyone's embracing it. I think this regulation was drafted pre-crypto. It's gonna, it's gonna, uh, it has the risk of driving smaller investors away, the ones that theoretically we wanted to bring back into the sort of market. It has, a, it has a risk of driving them away and taking away a lot of this and hitting hard, especially the social ESG, dri ESG driven uh, platforms. Um, and I think that's, you know, and at Raise, we're, we are above all, uh, socially driven platform in the sense that we're financing small businesses, local businesses, uh, you know, giving them a type of access to financing that, you know, only large companies have. Quick, streamlined, you know, low bureaucracy, et cetera. And I think you drive, you drive away the small investor, you drive away the crowd because of stiff regulation, because of pre-crypto mentality and and I think that's going to be bad for the market. But, you know, one, one last thing, you know, the, in, in Portugal, the, the crowdfunding regulation was approved in 2015. I remember the day, I was like, oh, it's approved. 
we were the first platform to be regulated in 2018. Things move very slowly. And so even though it's now, it's 11th of November, everyone's sort of excited, but ESMA has already, ESMA is the sort of European market regulator, come out saying that they need more time, standards are not ready, uh, and uh, you know, the local regulators have not even been nominated. Everybody expe ex expects the local market regulators to be the ones to be regulating this activity, but they haven't been formally nominated. I mean, things will take time. It will take time and yeah, it's just, I think, yeah, I, I agree. I think, you know, when things take time, um, you lose traction, people move to other things. We're moving forward with uh, our local regulation. We're very excited. We're growing a lot. And yeah, I mean, when the inter European regulation comes along, we'll, we'll have a look at it. And I think that ends the panel uh, from today with all, all these great in uh, interventions. Thank uh -huh. you all. <laughs>